praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> Talking this morning I'm thinking here just a moment. I ask people all the time, do you love Jesus? And they always say yes. I find you still get excited when I tell you I love chocolate milkshakes from Whataburger. But I want to submit to you, and we were talking about this this morning, that you need to examine your love for Jesus. How do you know when you love somebody? I, think, I appreciate your comments, I do. How do you know when you love and if you love Jesus? Do you honor him? Is he a priority? Think about your spouse, your family, your children, your grandchildren, things like that. Do you love your grandchildren? Do you love your spouse? How do you show it? All of these, these are good comments. But I do know this, and I was sharing this this morning at the close of my message, that when Jesus had the disciples meet him at Galilee after the resurrection, he pulled Peter over to the side. Peter had denied him three times. And he asked Peter a question three times. Do you love me? And the first time he asked that question, he used the agape word. The second time he asked that question, he used the phileo word. The last time he used a word that simply means, do you even like me? I think a lot of times when we're talking about our love for God, that in our head we're thinking, uh, yeah, I love God. There's no purpose and power to push that love. I believe that's one of the reasons why we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. And the teacher would teach you how to love. I had a real problem loving anybody or anything before I got saved, became a Christian. And after I became a Christian, I hadn't been in the church but just weeks. And I see all these people hugging and shaking hands and telling each other I love you and all that. And it just didn't register with me. I was raised in a home where I can never remember or recall any time that my mother or my dad ever said to me, I love you. It never happened. They were not that affectionate. Did they feed me until I was 12 and 13? Yes, and after that I fed myself. Did they give me a place to sleep? Yeah, I never went hungry, I never went cold, I had a bed to sleep in. But they met my basic needs, yes. But one day I was so overwhelmed that I went to my pastor and I said, can you teach me how to love? He thought I was weird. Well, I was, <laughs> but in, <laughs> still I am into a point. Anyway, but the whole deal was I was being genuine. I was being sincere. How do you go about loving people? I just met Raymond down here just a moment ago. Everybody loves Raymond. <laughs> Amen. And I told him just a little while ago, I said, I love you, brother. I just, yeah, there you go. We just met. It's a God thing. There comes that moment when there's a spiritual awakening inside to the point you can even love the unlovable. You know, your mother-in-law, I mean, uh, that sister-in-law, I mean, never mind. 
Do you love Jesus? I believe you. I'm going to take you at your word. That's not my message tonight. That's just what's on my heart. Amen. Look at somebody and say, I love you and God loves you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. This morning, my message was living in the countdown. No fainting allowed. Living in the countdown. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. Things on planet Earth are about to get very, very interesting. And nobody's going to be allowed to panic. We're going to keep it all together. We're going to keep it all under control. But my message tonight, yes, Jesus is coming. But first, the latter rain. Yes, Jesus is coming. But first, the latter rain. I asked the question, Jesus is coming. Why the wait? What are we waiting for? If Jesus is coming, why doesn't he come on? I don't know if you're aware of this, but you and I actually can speed up the coming of Jesus Christ. We can speed up the rapture of the church. We preached on that this morning. How do you speed it up? By doing what God called you to do. I look down here at each one of you. You're from everywhere and every walk of life. Why did God put you on this planet and why are you in this situation you're in right now? God has a purpose. God does not want you to miss that purpose. God has a grand design. What God has planned for you, for me, is better than anything we'd ever planned for ourselves. In fact, he tells us in one scripture, it hasn't even entered our mind the things that he has designed for us. Amen, 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 amen. I'm ready to do and to be what God wants me to do and what God wants me to be. Go with me to Hosea. That's a book you'll have fun looking for. It's in the Bible, believe it or not. Hosea chapter 6. I have preached several, several, several sermons in which I've used this scripture. and It's one of the scriptures that marked excessively in my Bible compared to other markings in my Bible. And I want to share some things with you before I get into the message itself. Hosea is writing this as a prophetic word. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Now, if you're just reading the Bible as a history book, you will understand that that's talking about the nation of Israel. And if I was to make the application, this is the nation of Israel, which it is in, uh, as far as the historical point, it would go something like this. Israel, it is time for us to return to God. He has torn us. He broke us loose, but he will heal us. The nation of Israel for the last 2,000 years has a history of brokenness. But in 1948, and again in 1967, and in here recently, we're seeing a healing process taking place. This is a prophetic word to the nation of Israel, and it goes like this in verse 2. After two days, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years. So I could put it this way. After 2,000 years, he will revive us. The nation of Israel is now approaching a third millennium, and in that we are seeing a revival of the nation of Israel. We are seeing the nation of Israel coming back to the, what they call Judaism, the uh, worshiping God under the law, the sacrifices and what have you. They have already prefabbed the temple. They can have the temple up in 30 to 90 days. They have uh, already found the red heifer that has to be offered at the 
first sacrifice. They already have trained their priests to do the sacrifices. All they need is permission to put the temple up. And the place where they want to put the temple up is the, uh, the, where the Muslims are worshiping at the Dome of the Rock. The thing is this, if you look at the, 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 uh, uh, the courtyard where the Dome of the Rock is, the Dome of the Rock is built over a cave. It is not built in front of the Eastern Gate. The temple gate faces the Eastern Gate. It has to be built in that place. There's room for the temple to be built facing the Eastern Gate without interfering with the Muslim Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is over a rock where the animal sacrifices were made. It's a cave underneath there. The blood of all those animals, like on one day, one day alone, 165,000 sheep were slaughtered. That's a lot of blood. The place can stink. But you could not smell blood anywhere. Why? Because the blood went down into that hole, that cave, and there was an underground spring of water down there that kept flushing the blood out, not only out of the cave, but outside of the city and kept it going. And guess where it was going? It was going into the Valley of Megiddo, which is where the Valley, the Battle of Armageddon is fought. The interesting thing is there is room for the Jews to have their temple, the Muslims to have their Dome of the Rock, and for the Christians to have a church. Those are the three groups that call themselves heirs of Father Abraham. All religions except those three are based on ideologies, the philosophies, and psychology. It's not based on God. I don't, talk, I don't care if you're talking about Hinduism um, or any of the other religions. Uh, I was, took a humanity class in college and called it studying the basic religion of the world, and they told me there were 11 major religions. And I wasn't a Christian, and I couldn't agree with anything they were saying. I want you to know there is one God. You can make a God out of anything. But there is only one God, there's only one plan of salvation, and there's only one way to heaven. And that way is Jesus, who said, I am the way. Now, here's the thing I want you to get. Two days, third day. Two thousand years, third millennium. Read it with me again. After 2,000 years, he will revive the nation of Israel, and in the third millennium, he will raise the nation of Israel up that they may live in his sight. But this is a prophetic word as well. And as a prophetic word, it applies to the believer or the church. And I can go through the same process and tell you this. The church has been here for 2,000 years. We're about to enter, we are entering now, we are already entering now the third millennium. Which means that Jesus is coming. But first, there's a latter rain. And if you look down, you'll see that in verse 3 at the close of it. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain on earth. He came on the day of Pentecost. We are coming very, very close to the day of Pentecost celebration on our calendar. In a couple of more Sundays, we're going to be having Resurrection Day. Easter Sunday, some people call it. I have a problem calling it Easter Sunday, but everybody knows what Easter means. The only problem is it originated as an Egyptian form of an Egyptian god. And what happened, there was this uh, buzzard or eagle that flew over and laid an egg and the egg hatched and that Easter bunny, I mean that, uh, you understand what I'm doing? But anyway, God came out of that, God came out of that egg and God is called Easter. No, I want you to know my God didn't come out of an egg. Are you understanding what I'm saying, okay? I want you to know if there was an egg anywhere, God made it. He didn't come from it, okay? <laughs> All right. But the whole deal is this. Uh, if you want to call it Easter Sunday, go right ahead. I'm going to say on Easter Sunday, we're going to celebrate Resurrection Day. Right. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But the beauty of that is this. That uh, 
after Easter, for the next 40 days, Jesus was with his people, giving them final instructions. And one of the things he said to them is, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel and heal the sick. Cast out the devil, bind up the brokenhearted, set the captive free. And folk, we have been telling the story of Jesus for a long time, but people have backed away from signs and wonders. They are afraid to deal with anything like praying for the sick. Jesus didn't tell you to pray for the sick. He told you to heal the sick. And most, of, most Christians don't feel like they have the power and ability to heal the sick. You don't. He is the one that does the healing, but you are the vessel he's working through. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You shall cast out devils. You'll bind up the brokenhearted. You'll cause the lame to walk. It's God working through you. And so what happens is you and God become one in partnership and in business. And in this scripture in Hosea, as you're reading through there, not only do you see the church, but you also see something else in that prophetic word. You find the four spirits of revival. And next Sunday... The evangelist is coming in to preach. We'll have praise and worship. We've got another church that's coming in to join us and do some praise and worship and uh, worship the Lord with us and believe God for revival. But there are four spirits of revival. In those four spirits, you find, first of all, repentance. Now, how many of you repented of your sins? What do you mean when you say, I repent? It means I turn around and go the other way. Now, that means a hundred and how many degrees? Thank you. You turn around and go the other way. That's 180 degrees. Some of us have only turned 90 degrees. You understand what I'm saying? Or maybe 45 degrees. I'm here to challenge you tonight. If we're going to serve God, we've got to do the 180 you understand what I'm saying? And so the first spirit of revival is a 180 degree turn. And so I'm challenging you this week as we go into next Sunday, let's make a 180 degree turn in every area of our lives, in the way we think, the way we talk, the way we live, everything. Hallelujah. The, the second thing that is there is the, in the spirit of revival, the second spirit of revival is restoration. Now, understanding what restoration is, everything that you lost serving the devil, everything that's been taken away from you, you may not want back. Hello? But in restoration, God is not going to restore you to what you were. He's going to restore you to what he created you to be. Are we still together? In the spirit of revival, you may find your whole life is changing. Uh, for example, I was in a revival at the Brownsville Church in Pensacola. In that revival, we had a spirit-filled Methodist evangelist, Ford Philpott, preaching. And we had a Baptist fellow by the name of John Osteen receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. We had another Baptist pastor that pastored one of the largest churches in Pensacola to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And his deacon board came down to hear him give his testimony in our church during that revival. They went back to the, their church after there and voted him out as a pastor. So my youth group, my youth band became his praise and worship team. And we cleaned up a, a bar that had gone out of business down, on, down the street from the church. And he opened up another church inside that bar and we got ready to tear the, uh, the bar itself out. He said, no, I'm going to use that for my pulpit. So we had to paint over all the graffiti on the walls and the bathrooms and everything else, get the smell out of the place. And the bar where you mix the drinks and everything became his pulpit. And he began to build from that. And from there he built Liberty Bab uh, Bible Church, the Liberty Baptist Church. And from there he built Liberty Bible College. And when he passed away, they wheeled all of that over. And that's the Teen Challenge Center there in Pensacola now. <laughs> wow. It was in that church that I saw some of the most phenomenal miracles I've ever seen. 
But the one that stands out more than anything else, I got a call from the pastor, and he's, he invited me over to come and meet the evangelist that was filling teeth. I said, what? He said, this evangelist fills teeth. If you've got a cavity, this evangelist has the ability to fill it and give you your choice of porcelain, gold, or silver. That's a farce, and I know it's a farce. I don't believe one word of this. He said, no, it's really happening. Sure it is. He's filling teeth. So I go over there, and because I'm in the ministry, he lets me on the platform, in which I was really thankful for, because I wanted to get over this evangelist's shoulder, looking over his shoulder into somebody's mouth, and see how he's filling teeth. Some of you look at me like, huh? I love you guys. He had a glass of some kind of disinfectant, I don't know what it is, and he had one of those little mirror things, you know, you stick the dentist sticks in there to look around, and you know, he had one of those. He'd stick it in there and stick it in somebody's mouth, stick it in there and stick it in somebody else's mouth, stick it in there, and, and I'm going, oh, gross, this is nasty. And I'm, I can get right on his shoulder. I want a bird-eyed view of this thing. I want to see it. And this was a young man that had a hole in his wisdom tooth. I mean, a big hole. And he said, yeah, I see the hole, yes, yeah, yeah. Any pain in there? And I'm thinking, well, this has got to be a joke. And then he said, what do, you, what do you want me to fill it with? You want gold, you want silver, you want porcelain? He said, well, I want my teeth white. He said, well, that's fine, okay. Then he prayed in Jesus' name, with this little contraption in this guy's mouth. I'm standing there with my eyes wide open. I'm not closing my eyes to pray. I want to see. And while I'm looking at it, I see a little bubble. And this bubble keeps coming up. Bubble keeps coming up. A little white bubble. And finally, the evangelist says, okay, grit your teeth now and let it take its shape. Freak me out. Do you know that half of the people in Pensacola did not believe it either? But when you have seen it, you can't deny it. Oh, I'm stirring you up. I love it. You're just looking at me like, I don't know if I believe you. You know? <laughs> but let me tell you something. Go back and read the book of Acts. Do you believe that a man who'd never walked since the day he was born could jump and run? Do you believe that a woman crippled and bent over for 18 years who could not look up and see the sky because all she could ever see was the dirt bent over? And God said, Jesus said, it is not right for the seed of Abraham to be bound. And he loosed her and she stood upright. Let me tell you something, you're a child of God, amen? That means you're the seed of Abraham. If you're the seed of Abraham, the devil had no right to hinder you physically, spiritually, mentally, or emotionally. And I declare tonight in Jesus' name, restoration. Restoring teeth is just one little thing. Restoring lives is a whole new thing. And he is in the business to restore life. Do you know I haven't even started my message yet? I'm just reading the scripture. Amen. <laughs> there is a third spirit of revival in this. And the third spirit of revival in this has to do with the harvest. And let me tell you how the harvest works. If I was to come out here and say, okay, I want you to go down the street and witness to five people Go knock on their door, go knock on the house, five different houses and witness to them, tell them about Jesus. How many of you ready to do it? <laughs> oh boy. Again in the Brownville Church, I was, I was on staff, the pastor brought in an evangelist and he didn't tell anybody what he was going to do and he had everything set up and everything ready. 
we all walk in for the service that uh, Sunday morning. Sunday morning, okay? We walk into the, everybody knows you go to church on Sunday morning to have church, you go on Sunday night. And you go to church on Sunday morning because you're supposed to. You go to church on Sunday night because you're expecting to receive something. You go to church on Wednesday night because you love God. Oh, it got real quiet, didn't it? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh. And so we go in there and we, we have praise and worship and it's time for the preacher to preach and everything. And we're getting ready to hear the sermon. He said, all right, I want everybody to come get one of these packages off the table here. And everybody was obedient. The whole church got up and went down there. And we got hundreds of packages all over the place and everything. He said, now, I want you to take an hour and be back in one hour. I want you to go witness to five different families. Go knock on their door and tell them about Jesus and leave the package. Try to get their name. If you can, get them to come back to church with you. Bring them back to this service. I've never seen so many people panic as I saw that morning. I was real thankful, I was youth pastor, I was real thankful that my young people were energetic and full of energy, ready to go, where the old people, some of them went home. <laughs> they did, they went straight home. That morning, one hour later, 15 new families walked into the church. 15. I want to tell you something. What you have in here is your witnessing tool. You don't need a pamphlet that says four spiritual laws. We've got that. But what you need is an experience in here. Folk, don't tell me your spaghetti is good. Give me some. And let me tell you what I think of it. You understand what I'm saying, okay? How many of you have Jesus? Does anybody want the Jesus you have? then why are you keeping him to yourself? It's time to talk about Jesus, amen? amen? So what was the first spirit of revival? What is the second spirit of revival? And the third spirit of revival is? Harvest. The fourth spirit of revival is signs and wonders. God is going to confirm his word. He's going to confirm your testimony. He's going to confirm your witness with signs and wonders. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Jesus told him, he said, go into the next town and tell them I'm coming and I'm here to tell you this, this evening, Jesus is coming. But first, the latter rain. The former rain was on the day of Pentecost. The birth of the church. 120 in the upper room began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. There was fire from heaven, there was a wind blowing. I'm going to tell you something, there's a storm coming like you wouldn't believe, the big one's coming. The perfect storm is about to break loose on the body of Christ. We're going to see things that will blow your mind. You talk about filling teeth, that's little stuff to what's coming. Amen? All right, let's go to James chapter 5. I'm having fun. I don't know about you. I'm running out of time having fun up here. James chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, anytime you read therefore in the Bible, look and see what it's there for. Therefore, be patient, brethren, believers. Be patient unto the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord 
is at hand. Now, I lived on a farm and a dairy and a chicken farm and all of that, so I was a country boy. And one of the things I remember is that my dad had all these fields. For example, we would take watermelon to the market. I'm talking about truckloads of watermelon, you know. We would take corn to the market, truckloads of corn. Uh, this, was what, this is what farming was all about. But my dad had a personal garden. He put it in a special location because the dirt there was richer than any of the dirt anywhere else on the place. We didn't get tomatoes that size, we got tomatoes that size, you know, that kind of thing. He used his best seed in that garden. Now, I'm a very impatient person. For example, I really like fresh tomatoes. And I really like those little ones, you know, I don't know what you call them, those cherry tomatoes or something, is that what they call them? Yeah, I love those things. I can, you know, just pop them like a piece of candy. And I'd go through there and I'm looking for the ripe ones and my dad say, leave them alone, they're not ripe. What is he waiting for? I'm ready to eat those tomatoes. This one's kind of pink, is that going to have No, wait for it to get ripe, you know, that sort of thing, all right? What am, I, what am I doing here? I'm trying to reap a harvest before the harvest is ready. And that scripture I just read to you says the farmer waits patiently. He wants the best harvest. The reason he wants the best harvest is because he planted the best seed. He planted his son Jesus in a grave. And when his son Jesus came out of that grave, that was first fruit, and there's more fruit coming. The Lord is waiting for the final harvest. This last harvest is going to be bigger than anything that's happened in the 2,000 years of the history of the church. But here's what I want you to get. I don't know when or where, but there's somebody that would be the very last person to get saved, and when that happens, Jesus is going to say, church, we got the harvest. Come home. Right now, people are getting saved all over the world. Muslims are getting saved. In the Middle East, Muslims are getting saved. Some of them are being persecuted. Some of them are being put to death. But Muslims are turning to Jesus. The Hindus are telling the Christians they're going to have to leave the country. The Prime Minister of, of India got saved. And he's, he told all the Christians, and as they were driving him out of the country, he said, Christians, you better go to America. I want to tell you something right now. Somebody's going to be the last one. And we're out of here. Jesus is coming. But first, the latter rain. One more scripture, John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 20. Am I doing okay? Yeah. All right. Chapter 12, verse 20. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. These are people who had been converted to Judaism. They had accepted, they had accepted Yahweh, God. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Jesus answered, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He's talking about himself. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life or surrenders his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Him my father will honor. 
How will he honor? He will show him favor and exalt him. Now, Jesus said, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Seven times, seven times, Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But finally, in this particular moment, Jesus said, now. I want you to know something. We've been saying it for 2,000 years, but I'm here to tell you tonight, it's now. Get ready. Whether the politics has anything to do with it, the economy, the world situation, all of these are signs. When you see these things happening, it's, it's to let you know that it, we're, we're getting close. I believe we're right there. And what we do with ourselves and our lives and our situations now is extremely important. First of all, remember the four spiritual laws of revival. But going back and reading with this, verse 27 again. My soul is troubled. What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And therefore the people who stood by and heard it said it has thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. I was praying in the altar like you guys were a while ago. And I heard God's voice for the very first time, knowing that was God. God said, turn around. Well, in the Brownsville Church at that time, we had, because of the size of the church, we had two altar rails. You had one altar like this, and then further out, you had another altar to accommodate people. I was kneeling at the first one. And God told me to turn around. I'm kneeling. I don't want to turn around. Hello? Anybody resemble that remark? He spoke again. Turn around. I don't want to turn around. I had, had, I had received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came on me, bam, and spun me around, and there's a guy kneeling at that altar, the second altar, right behind me, and I hit him in the forehead with my hand, bam, like that. I, I mean, it just happened. I wasn't con thinking about it, doing it, or anything like that. I went, boop, bam, and he actually flipped twice. Now, I was waiting for my pastor to throw me out. The brother got up. He looked at me and said, you don't know what happened, do you? Yeah, I know what happened. I just knocked you over, you know, this kind of thing. He had been diagnosed with sleeping disease. He couldn't stay awake. And he had fallen asleep there at the altar. The day before, they had fired him on the job because he kept falling asleep on the job. When I hit him, God healed him. Amen. Are you listening to me? How many times have I told the story of the drummer here with a dislocated shoulder? He was going to the bathroom over here. I was going to the lobby. We passed in the lobby, and I said, Hey, man, how you doing? Bam, and I slapped him on the shoulder. And he went, Oh! Preacher, God just healed my shoulder. I didn't even know I had a problem with it. I'm not the healer. He's the healer. But he's in us. And right now, how many of you have Jesus in your heart and life? Do you know that you're full of the power of God? How many miracles have you got bottled up inside of you right now? Are you still with me? The potential 
of harvest is inside of you right now. The potential of signs, wonders, and miracles, everything from casting out devils to filling teeth, that power is inside of you right now. When are you going to release it? Amen. Now, <laughs> you ready for me to start my sermon? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, Jesus is coming. Here's the bad part about the latter rain. We, the church, have the same problem that the early church had with the former rain. You know what it was? They, <laughs> thank you for asking. They had no clue what to expect. Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go tell them the good news. And I want you to minister signs and wonders. I'm going to confirm your word with signs and wonders. But first, tarry till you be endued with power. What does that mean? They had no clue. And so, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, he's given them their final instructions, and suddenly his feet come off the ground, and he begins to go up in the air, just like we're going to do one of these days. And the glory of God, the glory cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they're standing there looking, Suddenly there's two angels standing there saying, why are you standing here gazing up into heaven? Didn't he give you something to do? Go do what he told you to do. And so they go back to Jerusalem, weeping and wailing and mourning. No. Fasting and praying. No. They go back to Jerusalem rejoicing. Lift your hands and rejoice with me for a moment. Can you do that? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. <clears throat> if we could get a football spirit in church. Amen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Get the wave going. Hallelujah. <laughs> but seriously, they had no clue what to expect. What they did know to do was to love on God. And with a spirit of thanksgiving, for the next ten days, they had nonstop church. What do you do for 10 days? We have a problem doing something for 10 minutes. It's true. We're going to pray for 10 days, we are. Suddenly. 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 There came a sound. And God said, turn around. God said, turn around. And I didn't obey God, and so suddenly God turned me around, 180. And a man got healed. God's about to turn the church of this day and hour around. God is about to turn the church 180 degrees. Everything that we do, come on. Most churches that met at 6 o'clock are already home. But I want to tell you something. It's not how long or how short a service is. It's what happens. I don't want anybody to ever leave this church service feeling like we miss God. Get ready for the supernatural Get ready for something fresh. Get ready for something new. For those of you who are taking notes, 
If I had preached this sermon like I was supposed to, your first point would have been the latter rain is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God didn't give me and you the baptism in the Holy Spirit, Spirit for our personal use. Although the Holy Spirit is a teacher, a comforter, one who works beside us. But God put his Holy Spirit in you to do the same thing that he put the Holy Spirit in Jesus to do. Jesus never worked a miracle. Until he came up out of the water in the Jordan River and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. His first sermon was, he has anointed me. And he told the people why. You just received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Am I right? Let me tell you something. You're going to step out in faith real quick. And you're going to be shocked at the results you get. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Everybody that has the baptism in the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues every day. Pray in tongues in church, pray in tongues in your car, pray in tongues everywhere you go. I've even prayed in tongues at Walmart and had them look at me. And then I say, I'm Greek. <laughs> no, I don't do that. I don't do that. Oh, boy. Your second point. We must recognize the purpose of the latter rain. On the day of Pentecost, the religious leaders knew all the prophecies and did not recognize the fulfillment. Tonight I have told you, this morning I made mention of the fact that there are 318 prophecies in the New Testament about the coming of Jesus, and all of them have been fulfilled except two. One, the latter rain. Two, the final harvest. And they are going to happen together. And I believe it's going to start right now. And I believe Victory Christian Center, Hazel, Texas, in the Tri-County area is going to have a mighty visitation of the Holy Spirit. I believe that with all my heart. I do. I do indeed. Now, <clears throat> I made mention this morning that Jesus fulfilled his fourfold purpose or mission. And I made mention this morning that we have a mission to feel no fainting allowed. You want me to do what? No, that's not allowed. And I explained those four things like this. First of all, Jesus pleased the Father. Secondly, Jesus saved mankind. Thirdly, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Fourthly, he defeated the devil. His mission had been given to you and me. We have the same mission. The first mission we have is to please the Father. Jesus heard his Father say from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Oh, how I want to please him tonight. The second thing is saving mankind. Folks, you and I have got to become witnesses for the kingdom of God and bring people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. The third one is this, victory over death, hell, and the grave. How many of you are planning on resurrection morning? Amen. Let me tell you something. Death has no hold on us. Death is nothing more than walking out of one room into another room. I'm looking down here at uh, Michael. I'm going to have to put up looking at you for eternity. When God gives you a new body, I hope he makes a lot of improvements. No, I'm kidding you. But you know, the whole idea, the whole idea is this. Death, hell, and the grave have no hold on us. But here's the fourth one. The fourth point is Jesus defeated the devil. <clears throat> the devil has no power unless I give him mine. 
I want you to hear me now. Listen to me carefully. The devil's taxes is fear. What if? That kind of thing. What if I don't make it? You know, that kind of thing. What if we go broke? What if it all falls apart? What if? What if? What if? Fear. The opposite of fear is faith. Do you know how to get rid of the devil? Take a step of faith. He is afraid of faith. How many of you have just a little bit of faith? The faith, I mean, it's just a little bit. You've got some, but it's just a little bit. You don't have much, but you've got a little bit. How many of you got just a little bit of faith? I'm afraid to ask the next question. How many of you feel like you've got a whole lot of faith? I'm afraid of it. That's what I thought I was going to get. <laughs> But if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you understand what I'm saying? I think everybody in this room has got that much. The devil will run from a step of faith. So take baby steps if you have to take baby steps, but it's time to take a 180 degree turn and start walking for Jesus. And we're going to watch the devil go down in defeat. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I close with this. The third point being like Pentecost, the latter rain will be suddenly. I just mentioned that, but here's my point. If you want an Acts 3 experience, you're going to have to experience Acts 1 and 2. Well, what do you mean by that, preacher? Acts 3. The lame man at Gate Beautiful. If you want to see a demonstration of the power of God, Peter and John, in a spirit of agreement, looking on the lame man said, now if I quote the Bible, it says, silver and gold have we none. I happen to know they, their credit card wasn't, ext wasn't ex uh, already expired or uh, overextended. They were there for a religious holiday and they brought enough money to be there for the religious holiday. What he's basically saying is this, what I have is not silver and gold. What I have, though, I'm going to give to you. Come here, brother. I picked on you when tonight, didn't I? Amen. I'm going to give you what I got. I've got the power of God. It's all yours. Now you go home. You don't feel any different? Right. But do you believe what I said? That makes all the difference in the world. And even if you only believe what I said just a little bit, it's enough to get the job done. Hello? My baby brother was in college, and of course I'd been separated from my family for a number of years, and he was running into some of the problems that I had when I was home. And so he came to Pensacola to the church. I lived in a trailer next door to the church to spend some time with me but purposefully to ask what was the problem between you and dad and how, did, how do I deal with it? Well, we had a bunch of activities going that weekend and I told him, I said, let's get through the weekend and then we'll talk. And so I took him with me and we went through the activities of the youth and we went through the uh, special services we were having it, praise and worship and all that. It was all very, very good. God used that to touch my brother's heart. And so Sunday morning he sat through the service. Nothing really happened. Sunday night we're back. And we were praying like you guys were praying a while ago. But because my brother didn't want to go down front, he wasn't accustomed to that. He sat on the second row and I sat with him. 
And I'm praying for him. But I'm praying in the spirit. And he would, had his head down like this. I opened my eyes and I saw tears splashing on the floor. I froze. In that moment, here's my brother in church weeping. I don't know how to witness to him. I don't know what to say to him. I've been leading these kids in the youth group to Christ every week. My own brother. What do I do? What do I say? The minister of music saw what was happening. And he walked over to my brother and, and led him to the Lord. I was happy. And I was able to take my brother and get him in a church in, up in Alabama. And he wound up being a district official and all that kind of stuff. But in that one moment when he needed to get saved, I didn't. I, I couldn't do it. But I walked away from that service bound and determined. God, I will witness to every person you lay on my heart. If I do a good job, you get the credit. If I do a bad job, you're going to get that credit too. You understand what I'm saying? This is the best I can do. That's all God wants. Your best. He'll make up the difference. Give the Lord a praise offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. Stand with me. Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can be. Shout to all the people.